Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast, a show that inspires construction professionals to innovate and use technology to improve how they build our world. I'm Eric Thomas, and I've been working in construction for nearly a decade. And now I have the privilege to sit down with industry trailblazers to hear how they're solving construction's biggest challenges and redefining the future of the built environment. Welcome to another episode of Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. I am your host, Eric Thomas. Today, we are in Boston at the Technology Center here in the Autodesk office. I have the pleasure of speaking with Evan Riley, the Senior Emerging Technology Engineer with Skanska, and Fope Betamosi, the Circular Economy and Construction Researcher here with Autodesk. And the Technology Center, for those that aren't super familiar, is located in Boston's Seaport Innovation District. And this provides access to large format fabrication equipment. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see it all around me right now. If you're watching or listening rather on Spotify or Apple, you should head over to YouTube and check this out because we're in a very cool space right now. There's a wide range of robots, training, and you know everybody working here has a lot of um, opportunities to learn from expertise from Autodesk personnel. The spaces really bring together a, a global network of leaders, fabrication workshops, innovative ideas, and we get to bring cross industry experience, which is what we're doing today, and uh, and really test and you know try out new advanced processes. So both of you have been heavily rooted in the tech center, and I'm excited to learn a bit more about that and a whole lot more with construction. So how are you both doing now that I've gotten that monologue out of the way? Feeling good? Feeling good. Of course, since we are here together in the technology center in Boston, and both of you have had projects that are connected to this uh, space. I want to hear more about your experience working here. And so, Evan, can you give me a high-level overview of your experience and you know some of the projects you've touched? Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Thrilled to be here. A long-time uh, listener of the podcast, so honored to, to be back in Boston. Um, so last year, we, uh, we formed a team at Skanska, and we joined the residency program um, in order to test Spot, the robot dog from Boston Dynamics. And before we deployed the robot um, to any of our job sites in Boston, we actually made use of this great space here as kind of a controlled um, lab environment to um, get more familiar with controlling spot, um, mission planning. Um, it was really a unique opportunity for us to leverage the expertise at Autodesk in terms of robotics, in terms of fabrication, um, also an opportunity to really work out some of the kinks before we felt comfortable taking the robot out of the lab. My colleague, uh, Brooke Gemmel, who was actually on a previous episode of the podcast. Her episode just came the, out recently. The we had a great conversation. Yep. So the two of us co-led that effort, and uh, she was actually able to present some of our research findings at AU uh, back in November. Um, and it was a great opportunity. It actually triggered some, some follow-up conversations um, about rob, uh, job site robotics in general, both internally and externally. So really happy to be back in this great space that we uh, used as a, as a testing bed. Yeah, it's a cool catalyst and a really nice environment to, to, you know, try these things. And it's like a safe space to do that because you have so many opportunities and so much expertise to come in here, which we're actually very fortunate because you come from the other side of things and supporting some of these teams. And so I'd love to hear more about your experience and how you've been working in the tech center. Um, yeah, so I'm a researcher with the AEC Industry Futures team at Autodesk Research. And our job is to collaborate with you know people like Evan, so industry experts and customers uh, to determine their needs, how they work and the challenges they face so we can um, both together come up with solutions uh, to help them do their jobs better. So in our research with industry customers, we typically, you know, um, come away with key insights um, and we get to test and validate new design to make um, technology, some of which even end up finding homes in Autodesk products like the generative design feature in Revit, for example. And as uh, Evan mentioned, the Technology Center um, presents like a controlled, simulated real life environment where you get to um, collaborate with researchers or the, um, and the Technology Center uh, shop supervisors to prototype and validate um, whatever um, hands-on research you're doing, which usually tends to require some um, to scale models, so like a real life uh, scale model. And um, an example of that, so I was recently on a team that completed the Dar five meter bridge, which we printed um, right over there. That was the one that was at AU, right? That was the one that was at AU. Um, and, you know, 
to gather everyone on the team, internal and external co collaborators, uh, we're able to bring that project to life. The goal was to imagine how a th robot with 3D print um, an infrastructure of its own with little to no human input. And, you know, we were able to do that. And that showcases, I think, the extent of collaboration we do with customers, um, residents of the outside network, um, Autodesk researchers and the technology uh, center shop staff. It's, it's really cool how these two come together and, and your perspectives are different because you're, you're out on project sites, you're touching the technology in, in more of a, you know, actual out in the field setting and you get to connect all of the great work that you're doing together in the spaces you know seems to be a, a fantastic unifier to achieve both of those goals at the same time so i appreciate that context it's it's great to you know bring both of you together to to connect the dots there for everybody else who's not familiar with this space so evan you mentioned in an earlier discussion that we had that technology became a, a core element of your career and really influenced the role that you have at skanska today do you have any advice for others out there who are looking to move forward in their careers and specifically looking to distinguish themselves with technology? Like what's your journey look like in that realm? And what would you tell somebody else who wanted to follow in your footsteps? Absolutely. You know, I think uh, no matter what role or department you're in, uh, technology and this digital mindset um, can really help you excel at your job. Um, it can provide a way to, you know, set, up, set yourself apart from others. Um, in my role, you know, throughout my career so far, I've naturally kind of gravitated towards technology, whether it was model-based uh, model estimating when I was in pre-con or drones, um, underground modeling or laser scanning when I was a project engineer. Um, you know, partly because I saw those as learning opportunities, but also because I really wanted to push the envelope on my project or for my project team. Um, I think, you know, navigating uh, your career or your early career in this industry you know, it means having respect for um, the expertise that's out there, the people that have um, been doing things a certain way and the way things are done today, uh, but also having, you know, an eye on, on the future as well. Um, so my, my advice would also be, uh, you know, not to focus on learning technology skills for the sake of technology, um, but also really using it as a conversation starter, a way to learn more about a process, a problem, um, and also to learn more about people. So uh, to kind of tie that back to the research that we did with Spot, um, you know, yes, we were investigating um, the reliability and the agility of the hardware, the robot, um, but we were also able to uncover a lot about human behavior and what, you know, the human element, the human aspect of having a robot on a job site um, and, you know, maintaining clean, safe job sites. And, and people listening will laugh because I say augmentation all the time now. It's, it's a big aspect of this, but you made two points that I think are really important for others to consider. And as you get down that technology journey, I'm learning time and time again that people still are the connecting thread. And you made a fantastic point of you're not going to go on a project site and you're going to talk to a superintendent who's been doing something for 30 years and say, now nah, get out of here with that. Here's this tech tool that you've never seen. Go do that. That's not a approach that is going to, one, be received very well, but two, the the learning and the experience that the people that have been in this industry for so long have is instrumental in ensuring that the technology that we're trying and experimenting in places like this and elsewhere is going to be successful. And so if you could bridge those gaps, it's it's a really beautiful two-way learning opportunity. And I, it might have been Brooke who was telling me this at AU. It might have been somebody else. I can't I can't remember. If Brooke, if you're listening and you weren't the one, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the, the pairing of somebody who is younger and potentially more tech savvy and has some different innovative ideas with the industry with those supers and foremen and, and other people in the field who have 20, 30, 40 years of experience is really enlightening for our industry at large because the knowledge sharing is not a one-way street in that situation. And especially if those people start moving closer to retirement, we need that knowledge. We need to get it into the heads of everybody else who's still here building and you know meeting the needs of everybody out there in the world. It's, a, it's an exciting moment. Um, and I'm glad we finally have purpose-built technology where there was none 15 or 20 years ago, but we also have to be mindful in, in the human element as we bring that all to market. There's a lot to be thought of, but yeah. it's cool that you can differentiate yourself like that. Just, just to add to that, I mean, I, I completely agree that, you know, the, the knowledge transfer or the learning has to be, you know, has to go both ways, but it can also be really rewarding for both, uh, both parties. 
Um, and technology, again, is not the, the silver bullet, but I feel like it's a conversation starter. It's a way for um, us to learn more, you know, dig a little bit deeper into a problem or challenge um, and, and learn more about the people aspect. Yeah, we get to layer the technology to solve problems and allow people to do what people do better and let the technology do things that people can't do at scale or safely. There's, there's so many nuances to it. But even just based on what we've talked about so far, it's clear that you've had very different roles within the AAC industry, even though they have a very obvious intersection from what we've talked about here. So, Evan, can you give me the 10,000 foot view of how your expectations about your career differed from what actually unfolded and what you're actually doing you know, in your day-to-day -day role to right now? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with today. Um, so I'm part of our national emerging tech team um, at Skanska, um, which you know we're, we're tasked with basically helping research and evaluate uh, new solutions for our project teams, um, documenting pilots of new technology, training, um, connecting people, and also just promoting kind of a culture um, of innovation. Um, specifically, I focus on laser scanning, uh, our drone, managing our drone program and, and data. Um, but, you know, if I, if I go back, you know, seven years ago when I was studying civil in engineering um, and doing my first couple um, internships in construction, you know, I was, I was keenly aware that I was joining the industry at a really exciting time in terms of digitization, in terms of um, investment and startup activity. Um, but given everything that I also heard about uh, labor challenges um, and declining productivity, you know, the, the, the graph that we see in every <laughs> slide deck. Yeah, the McKinsey one that needs to go away because I disagree with it so very much as far as how productive and innovative our industry is today. It's changed so much. <laughs> right, right. But that was very much the messaging when I was in school. Um, but I think I expected there actually to be a lot of resistance to um, trying new things, uh, encouraging new ideas, you know, creative problem solving, especially for someone in their early stages of the career. Um, and I was definitely wrong about that. I would say that, you know, even though we're in a risk averse industry, um, there really is a willingness to try new things, uh, to hear people out if they have an idea, um, to experiment. Um, you know, especially at Skanska, we really have embraced this kind of culture of being a, a team of innovators and uh, connecting the, the dots in our organization. Um, but I also think, I used to think coming out of school that you know, all of the creative, innovative ideas originated from an innovation group. Um, I now, you know, have come to understand over the last seven years that really those ideas come from our project teams. They come from operations, the people that are closest to the work. And, you know, our mandate as an innovation group is really just to, to support them. Um, yeah, to support them and foster that, that culture of, uh, you know, failing fast and, um, and culture is the key word there to me because you can set your organization up to encourage people to bring new ideas and also try things if when you try something and fail and it's a punitive response, nobody's going to bring new ideas to the table because that's personal risk for them. They don't want to do it. And so I, I'm seeing our industry evolve and be more open to those conversations. I've also seen and been in those rooms where there's a bid review that lasted eight hours and there are grown men screaming at each other on the side of the table. I feel like we're starting to move away from that, which is really encouraging. And I think that's also a requirement to get the younger generations involved because they see that and they go, I don't want anything to do with that. And so it's we're at an exciting moment. There's some challenges, I think, coming with the uh, labor shortages and all the other fun things that, you know, we talk about every day. Um, fun is obviously not the right descriptor there, but, you know, it's, it, we're getting there. And so, Fope, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts in contrast, too. So when you stepped foot into, you know, your career path with construction, what did that look like in your mind compared to what you're doing today? Yeah, I think um, trying new things is what got me uh, to where I am today is also. Uh, so, like I said, I'm a researcher. So really, my day to day is really about um, exploring the latest and greatest advanced practices and technology and seeing how that impacts the way we construct buildings. Um, and at the same time, trying to address some of the global challenges that's associated with all of that. Uh, looking back, I really didn't think I was going to end up like being a construction technology researcher. Um, like 15 year old me wanted to be an architect. I didn't even know that construction management or building engineering, which was the um, degree I got as undergrad, was potentially a career path or option for me. And um, 
after graduation, you know, I did my first big girl job was working with my state government on refurbishing um, public schools and public housing. And for me, and at that time, I thought my career would be very much field oriented, um, trying to implement uh, some affordable housing solutions in Nigeria or Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, that, that's what I thought my entire life <laughs> career was going to be. Um, but, you know, that experience opened me up to a lot of the inadequacies in the um, ecosystem of construction in Nigeria. So I decided to like, get a master's degree in the U.S. and see what I can learn to take back, you know, to Nigeria and help fix uh, some of the problems. Um, and it was through that process I got, you know, introduced to construction technology and, um, you know, I got really interested with you know, the application of drones and AR, VR, laser scanners and all of that in construction processes. And that, that, that's been um, the trajectory of my career for a couple of years. Um, and I ended up just specializing in advanced construction technologies. And afterward, it seems like, oh, academia is the next best thing, um, doing research and teaching. Uh, but that, you know, takes a lot of your time with teaching. So that's how I ended up with, um, at Autodesk is really just trying to um, question the way things are done. I think you had kind of mentioned that having that um, problem solving mindset, like questioning the norm, how can we do things better? Um, how can we, you know, make more sustainable um, practices or use technology to optimize, you know, the traditional processes that we've always done. Um, so while I didn't end up on the field, I think uh, some of the work that we do is set up to empower um, folks that are on the front line on the field doing the work, helping them to make, you know, decisions and improve uh, some of the processes they're doing um, to help tackle all these problems that everyone's talking about. And, and it's a multi-layered conversation that we're having too. And I'm, I'm just encouraged by you know, people like yourselves who are given the space to ask questions and, and think about how could we do it differently? Because I think long-term, one of the risks to our industry is when we get too much pushback on let's try a different approach and get that this is how it's always been, so this is how it should be. And there's obviously a balance because we've been building things in certain ways for 100, 120, 150 years or even longer, and there's reason for that. But we're at a really unique moment where we can at least step back and consider, like, how do we adjust this for efficiency, reducing waste, you know, creating more safety opportunities and such. So there's, there's a lot there. And you know, when we think about these expect expectations being so dramatically different, like my journey through construction was very different as well. So I, I have a degree in technical communication, scientific and technical communication, whatever the heck that is. I, I still don't know. It doesn't matter. And I got hired at a construction company as a proposal writer, knowing nothing about construction. I remember the first six months I felt so overwhelmed, especially being on the federal side, acronyms everywhere, all these requirements. And it just started to click. And I was like, okay, this is interesting, exciting. But when it really got exciting for me is when I started being able to see the different technology we're using and the opportunities that were coming and where some of the younger generation was coming out and really excited in the way you are. And it's now it's a different conversation. And obviously, you know, having a chance to host a podcast like this and speak with you is very different than writing proposal responses to RFPs because RFPs are like a swear word in my <laughs> house now um, <laughs> after too many years and too many long deadlines. But with those dramatically different expectations, and Evan, I'm going to kick this your way first. Why do you think they were so disconnected from what really unfolded? Like what conditions in our environment in, in the construction industry and it's a very common scenario is somebody comes out of school and they think they're going to do this. They step on a job site, they start learning stuff and they go, I had no idea all of this was even here. Like, what does that look like in your perspective? Why does this keep happening? <laughs> yeah. So I think that there are, are different expectations because construction really does have a, a bad reputation. Um, you know, most people think it's old school. You know, they think, you know, we haven't changed the way that we're building buildings. Um, and that it's not a technical industry that, you know, requires a, an advanced um, education. Um, I also think that there is this misconception that, you know, innovation at a construction company um, has to be, um, you know, BIM and VDC 
And it, it, it's really interesting. I think that, you know, over the last six years, seven years that I've been part of the industry, there's, there is a new space uh, that has opened up for folks that are interested in um, deploying and evaluating technology that has nothing to do with the digital model. Um, I think those are kind of two misconceptions um, about the industry that we can we can challenge. And your point on the VDC being the IT god of the entire construction company is, is so accurate because they were some of the ones that were more progressive originally. And so they were able to grab that and go, OK, and people come to them with those questions and say, well, I know, you know, technology. So how might I be able to do this or change this? But you're right. As the technology becomes more accessible and more available, I think everybody has the opportunity to be some degree of technologist if they're interested. And it's it's going to eventually be a requirement for all of these jobs in the future, not just a nice to have. So in your experience, how does that align with what Evan said as far yeah, as Yeah, similar as well. So from like a research lens, so starting to see these perception challenges where, um, you know, professionals, professionals are grappling with um, adopting new ways of designing or building um, that might lead to more environmentally friendly or more um, resource efficient um, processes, right? So there's concerns about costs and, you know, implementing some of these could initially be expensive. They don't want to touch that at all. Um, we're having, you know, issues about complexity, but innovation doesn't really have to be complex. Um, you can start off small by, you know, fixing that one problem that someone on site has, for example. Um, and there's, of course, there's knowledge gaps. So some of the research that we do does translate into practice through like education and awareness. So just by, you know, trying to provide, um, information about what's out there and educating people um, can lead to more curiosity and help them, um, you know, get more training in that field, for example, just to to implement some of those on their their processes. And that to us is a win. Um, but there are these different challenges that people are saying, and most of that can be um, overcome. It doesn't really have to hinder anyone from um, trying out new things or exploring innovative or advanced methods on their, pro um, on their projects. Um, and just tackling all of this, I think, is really important to advance in the industry further. And, and I love your point about, you know, the focus of starting small, too. It was something that we, we uncovered. I was working with FMI on a, a research report about data more specifically in the last few years. And uh, if you haven't read it, uh, I've plugged this many times on the show. You should go check it out. It's called Harnessing the Data Advantage of Construction. But people often don't make changes because they're overwhelmed. There's a decision paralysis because especially if you're a builder that hasn't had the opportunity to digitize heavily or adopt these more you know, digital or advanced methods, it's overwhelming on where to start. And I always tell people, I'm like, you don't have to change everything at your company tomorrow. And actually you're more beneficial by picking a small area that you feel the most advanced in, or you have your biggest champions and you make those changes there. And when you start making those small innovations, you can go to the rest of the people in the company and point at that and go, look at this. When we digitized you know, Sam goes home at 4.30 and Shauna goes home at 4.45 and you're here, you know, working on paper and you go home at 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night or whatever the process might be that you're changing. And as you build those proof cases, then you get to slowly start making those incremental things. So it doesn't have to be a whole a whole company thing. But I'll, I'm going to park that because I'll talk about that for 10 hours if uh, if you let me. But I'd, I'd like to come back to that perception problem that you've both identified. And it's something I've heard a number of times. And I'm thankful for this conversation because I feel like it's you know a step in that direction and uncovering the problem. But what steps should we be taking right now to tackle that problem, whether it's something that an individual can take, like the conversation we're having here, or something that, you know, a larger construction company or potentially an education institution can have. Like where, where should we be starting at this point? And I'll kick that to you first, Evan. Yeah, I think we can start to, to change the narrative really by doing maybe a better job of storytelling. I think um, we can really start to highlight, you know, uh, successful implementations on projects. Also, you know, in, uh, employees that have more diverse uh, career paths, um, you know, on an individual level, I think at, a, you know, at a company, we can, we can all also educate our teams about, you know, um, what possible solutions are out there, um, you know, from the very mature um, applications that we might already be using um, 
to you know the early stage ideas, early stage startups where there isn't even a well-defined company yet. Companies like Skanska, you know, we can focus on sourcing ideas from our employees. Um, we can also just highlight the people that are actually using the technology every day, not necessarily even myself or uh, people in innovation roles, but you know, the people that are really um, deriving the most the most value from the tools. Um, and then in terms of the, you know, the talent pipeline, I think we can really focus on higher education and, um, you know, getting young people and students in particular, um, you know, excited about careers in construction. Uh, technology is one way to do that, I think, to make it more attractive, um, pull more people in. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think from the individual perspective, really sharing your story and your experience is important, especially, like you said, to the younger generation, um, trying to change that narrative of what construction really looks like and, you know, about promoting it in a positive lens. I think it's important. Um, and I really like to emphasize um, collaboration between industry and academia. Um, that's important because, you know, um, through construction programs that, you know, have industry advisory boards, for example, really take their curriculum um, serious because they try to implement really what's going on in the industry. So as soon as their um, students graduate, they have the skills that the industry needs. And I think that's also important in fostering um, research from the education level. So um, having faculty and students working on solutions and having an industry partner that's willing to, you know, help develop and implement those ideas on site kind of bridges the gap between research and academia. Um, and I find that to be really important. And it's a cool, like, multi-layered approach, too, because you have different perspectives coming from academia versus the perspective that you might have had coming through, you know, school and being in the industry for a year or your research background. And then when you add the trade conversation to it as well, it's the perception is very unfortunate because there's this there's narrative that kind of started, I think, in the 80s more than anything is you must go to college and you must get a four year degree. And if you are a blue collar worker, you're not going to make any money and it's going to be miserable. And that's just not true. I, I know a number of trade workers who make considerably more money than my friends who have gotten four year degrees and are passionate about what they're doing because they, they have a craft. The, the work that they're doing is so beautiful in like the finish, like in my house, like for example, this is a small potatoes example, but like I am not good with small details when it comes to building or construction. I know this. So I will never ever lay tile in my house, for example, because I know that I will never be happy with the end result of that. And the people that have the skill set to do that well, it's so impressive. And I will happily pay somebody to come do that. And it just scales as you get into bigger projects and such. And so I think as we give those examples, like you're both sharing and tell students, hey, this is this is what's out there. And this is what you can do. And this is how much money you can make. And you're not going to have $100,000 in debt. Like there, there's a lot of important information to to share. But I also know you've both worked with students a considerable amount and were, of course, students in construction programs at some point. So there's a, a perspective there that I don't have coming from TechCom. And so I'd, I'd like to hear more about those experiences, especially I know there's some international experience there that we can kind of compare with the United States. So Evan, can you give me a thought about or give me your thoughts and experience about, you know, how you've worked with students in the past and, you know, how we could continue to bring that to others as well? Yeah, working with students is really important to me. It's also really important to to Skanska. Um, you know, one thing I've witnessed since I've been out of school is that, you know, we're definitely in the midst of a construction boom on college campuses as well. Um, you know, beyond just inviting students um, to visit our sites, um, there's a real opportunity to engage with students in the classroom, um, to showcase like real examples from projects on campus, kind of like a living um, a living lab is a term that, you know, you hear a lot about. Um, you know, at Skanska, we have footprints on a lot of college campuses and universities, including Columbia, Duke, NC State, um, UVA, and, and Virginia Tech. And I've, I've been lucky enough to present many times in front of students, and I love doing it. Um, we've also, you know, in addition to just inviting students to visit the job site, um, We've also, you know, we've also met them halfway. We've met them in the classroom. We've uh, challenged students to uh, try and solve problems that we face in construction. For example, we had a group of Duke students looking at developing a 
app for managing deliveries, or we had another student group looking at how can we make scissor lifts, uh, scissor lifts more safe. I really think that we can also, in addition to those kind of creative projects, we can also look to kind of broaden our base and engage students at, that are, you know, from maybe atypical majors, so not just uh, construction management programs and I'm a good example of civil, that. <laughs> exactly, people from from different um, different degrees, not just uh, not just civil engineering and mechanical engineering. Computer um, engineering. Exactly, looking mm -hmm. at computer engineers and um, uh, graphic design even, data analytics obviously is becoming yeah. more important. Um, we also have a partnership with the University of Washington where um, we teach an intro BIM certificate class. And the cool thing about that is that each lecture, um, we bring in a different expert uh, from our Skanska VDC team. Um, I actually was a student in that class in 2018 as a new, um, as a new VDC engineer at Skanska. And that's kind of what set me on my, on my path. But, um, you know, three years later, I was, I was teaching our intro Revit um, and BIM execution plan class. So, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the people that benefit from these uh, classroom lectures and classes, you know, go on to become uh, teachers in their in their own right. So I think we need to be doing more projects, um, more site visits, um, and more, um, yeah, and more and more work in the classroom. And it's it's such a hands-on approach too. And like I know a lot of builders will have a presence at universities in that they show up for recruiting events and they go, hey, come work for us, you're a civil engineer. But the, the depth of what you're talking about right now, I think that's that's where we get to start pulling levers and changing perceptions because like you said, they're being encouraged to try new things. You're highlighting some of the cool opportunities. You're showing the potential for the different programs. And if it's, if it's integrated also, when you're bringing in interns and you're having them work with your organization, most of those interns, if they're good, they end up getting hired by that company later too. And so it's it's a really beautiful feedback loop and their friends are gonna encourage their friends to go check that out because they've had a good experience. And so you can build on that, but we have to be very deliberate because it's not something that's gonna happen passively by any means. And how's that looked with your experience? You've also worked with a lot of students, I know. Yeah. Um, I come from academia so I taught so I've been teaching um, graduate and undergraduate classes in construction for a while I started off during my PhD at um, University of Florida um, ended up teaching the construction class that shifted my perspective and changed my career path um, and most of that has been like hands-on you know learning um, incorporating technology in the classroom trying to get students engaged um, right early on um, and after graduation I joined the faculty at Wentworth Institute of Technology here in Boston also just like teaching um, intro to BIM, Revit, estimating, and a whole bunch of other classes. Um, but there's a point you mentioned about, you know, having industry um, partners, guest lecturing in, in classrooms. And um, when I was a professor, I found that students really um, got a lot out of those particular classes, so the guest lecture classes, because they get to see what a potential career in construction could look like for them. Um, and this ties back again into telling our stories, because we all have diverse perspectives. And, you know, a student might like estimating more than being a VDC, or um, they might like scheduling more. But having these conversations and showing them practical examples, I think has found um, has had more impact on students from what I found. Um, but since leaving academia, um, I also try to, you know, continue to give back as well. So I still do a lot of guest lectures on construction technology. Um, I collaborate with Kellyanne Mahoney, who's on the ACS team. Um, we do um, pre-college and college students um, outreach, trying to get them involved in construction or construction related paths, you know, engineering. Um, but like, to so the point you also made about the trades, we also showcase the different um, aspects of construction that's available to everybody. Because um, like you said, a four year degree might not be what someone's interested in. And there's so many more um, opportunities that's out there. Um, and I think also, um, it's important to, you know, get students while they're young. So I um, do a couple of after school programs. So like talking to people in the boys and girls club and just showing them uh, what they could be if they're interested. Um, but I do try to um, kind of evangelize that to target um, a lot of the underrepresented um, 
communities in in construction, um, especially, you know, young girls and women. Um, so I think that's important to to just continuously have that industry academia um, collaboration. And, and there's so many, both of you just said so many things that I want to respond to. So I'll just pick a couple because I'm a giant nerd. And I can't help myself. I, I love the, the diversity conversation is, is such an important one. And I feel Sometimes people are dismissive because they go, oh, diversity, yeah, we have a program for that. But it's it's so much more than that because the different perspectives that you get to bring help you solve problems in such unique and interesting ways. And to be able to understand and bring somebody else's background to a particular problem, they might have seen something or heard something or experienced something that I might never have even had the opportunity to that's going to get us to solve that problem in 20 minutes versus me on the internet to, uh, asking Dr. Google how to help me on something specific, you know? And so finding ways to be very deliberate about that inclusiveness is great too, but also with the underrepresented groups, I know women are not very well represented in construction and minorities often aren't as well, especially in leadership roles. We're missing so many people that can fill these very empty seats right now. And so if, if we're not addressing people and creating an equitable environment to have people comfortable to work in construction, we're failing ourselves and we're failing all of these different people. But also, we don't all have to be civil engineers. We don't all have to get a construction management degree. You mentioned the computer engineering and science degrees. Like the data aspect of construction is so tremendous and everybody hears me talk about it all the time. So I'll keep it brief today, but that is such an interesting opportunity because somebody who is a data scientist specifically can bring so much to an organization of the size of Scanska or a smaller organization. And they don't necessarily have to be where your headquarters is too. And so you're opening up opportunities to people who live in different areas and environments. And obviously we are builders, but not every single role has to you know, have a job walk every other day. You bring them in when you need them to, but otherwise they still add value and it's a wonderful career. So I'm, I'm excited now, I'm all fired <laughs> up, I'm sorry, but there's, there's some cool stuff going on. And I'm curious when, when you're speaking to students and young people in general, what got them the most excited? Like, what fired them up when you said, oh, hey, here's a potential that, you know, you might not have expected. Evan, I'm curious, what, what got your students kind of amped up about construction? Yeah, I've given a lot of presentations recently, kind of, you know, exactly, like trying to hype, hype up, uh, you know, construction technology uh, in front of students. And I feel like the, the thing that they get most excited about is, is drones and robotics. I think it's kind of like the, uh, the futuristic tools that are... Um, you know, slowly becoming more, you know, commonplace and ubiquitous on, on job sites. We got a giant robot well, arm right here is a wonderful example. Exactly. Yeah. Um, listening to this conversation. Um, <laughs> I also think that students, you know, they also get excited about seeing like practical uh, use cases of BIM, um, you know, beyond the classroom. I think, you know, that they're obviously learning about BDC and, 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 and BIM tools in the classroom, but to actually see you know, real stories and real examples of, of practical use cases, uh, practical use cases of uh, BIM coordination on a job, I think is really important. Um, you know, beyond just seeing, you know, flashy uh, screenshots of, you know, of, of the model versus what was installed, but actually hearing like real stories about how crises on projects were averted or, or real, you know, real value, I think, um, Students get excited about that. And the depth of the data that we have now is in, in the models is so much more than we had. I mean, the promise vision of BIM 15 years ago, we're actually starting to get there now. Like the amount of decisions and information and the interconnectedness is, is really exciting. And when you can qualify that and say like, this isn't just a model, like this connects to the schedule. This does all these things. This can help your business make decisions in a more effective way. That's when the lights start coming out. Oh, really? You can really connect the dots that way? So that's pretty uh, pretty excellent to hear. What uh, what about you? What what really uh, lights up your students when you work? Yeah, I'm going to pick up from what Evan said, um, but I think... Students get really excited when you show or you present examples of um, like a local significant construction project that they could go to and they can visualize like the impact of the work that they could do um, to the world or their communities. And then you mentioned like Skanska does like the living lab um, project type with the projects that you have on campuses and you invite students to come in um, and see what's going on. And I, I see the students really enjoy, you know, that those kinds of um, 
practical examples that they could relate to. And it's not something that's, you know, abstract to them. Um, but what, one other thing I will mention is to the younger generation, um, they have an increased awareness of like the environmental problems that um, all the environmental issues definitely more than I had um, growing up. And they always have questions related to, you know, how construction contributes, but can also um, help tackle um, some of the climate change um, processes. So I usually have um, lots of questions about sustainable materials or processes that help with, you know, carbon capture and, and things like that. And I, and I think that's impressive from, from that generation. And, and it feels like technology is now making some of those sustainability conversations that we were having 10 or 15 years ago a lot more meaningful and, and actionable for the individual as well. But I like your, your point there on being able to go and say, how, how do I have that impact? And it's something that I've always thought about when we're doing industry research, for example, when you go through and you calculate a, how much rework in the industry is caused by thing or whatever, you can float out this millions, billions number. And that's alarming, obviously, in an important context to have. But we always try to break it down in smaller bites, too, where we go, how, how does this waste tie back to a general contractor of a certain size, like Skanska size? And you say, oh, well, for every $4 billion in revenue you do, you're wasting X millions on this because your process is like that. Those things start to click then because now it's a bit more about how, how do I have an impact on this? How does this impact my business and me personally? And if you talk too big picture, sometimes it's easy to get lost in the weeds a little bit. And so I, I like that example as far as, you know, bringing it home and, and being very clear about the impact that they can have on, you know, problems that they're we're already experiencing, you know, firsthand. I mean, just look at the, the craziness of the weather in the United States in the last two or three years. And it's, you know, escalating as far as... Uh, um, and that goes. So, you know, in, we all play a role and construction is a big aspect of, you know, emissions and waste and everything else. So I, I appreciate that perspective very much. So I'd like to take a look at what the students were really surprised to learn about or see was a possibility for a career in construction that they may not have been aware of. Um, Evan, can you share some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we've already hit on this theme in our conversation today, but I think many students are really surprised to learn that there are various um, alternative career paths in construction. Um, you know, you don't need to follow this conventional path uh, through project management or becoming a, a site superintendent. I think that that message is kind of uh, reinforced in school or um, in your initial round of internships. That's, um, that's back to the, the way we've always done things narrative we were talking about before. It's a good point. Exactly. Um, you know, I think if you if you want to innovate, you can be in any role. You know, I obviously started in the field, uh, then moved to, to pre-construction and project management and then innovation and VDC. Um, but I like to, you know, remind students, not that they have to follow my path, but that, you know, they really should follow their interests and explore um, roles that excite them. Um, one way to do that is to, you know, interview your coworkers to find out more about what they do, even if there isn't a direct line of, of management there. Um, I also advise students um, that, you know, joining the industry, there might be times when uh, there are certain tasks that you have to do that you're not particularly excited about doing, um, you know, like posting RFIs or doing quantity takeoff or even taking progress photos. Um, but I try to remind them to, to try to see the big picture kind of value of doing those tasks and how that supports the, the success of a project, but also Look at those. Um, look at those as opportunities to innovate as well. Yeah, thankfully we have more technology that touches takeoff and you know site photos and such. The the doldrums aren't quite as bad as they might have been five years ago. But you're absolutely right. Not every job every day is rosy and sunshine. So it's it's good to have that perspective. But it's it's also good to hear what you know um, they're a bit surprised about. Have you encountered similar things or anything else that's a little yeah? Different? I think Evan stole my answer. Um, <laughs> but I think one thing I'll add is that some students are not really aware of the diversity and inclusion efforts that are going on in construction. Um, of course, people still see it as a male-dominated um, industry or a white male-dominated industry. And um, that's why, you know, I keep saying it's important we share our stories and our experiences because 
they don't really see that. And sometimes some of that is not um, evident through academia until maybe they get into an internship or into a company that they're working for. Um, so, yeah, I think that's one thing we definitely need to do better, just sharing our um experiences and stories and showing them how diverse actually construction is. And, and you make a great point too. It's it's not just the the business side of diversity. And we talked about that a bit earlier as far as the, the value that brings to your business and the different perspectives too. But it's important for people to be able to see themselves in that role potentially. And, and you're absolutely right. If I am a professor and I'm giving a lecture as the typical person that's in construction as far as being a white man in my you know, late 30s, that perception is a little bit different than the story that you are telling today and you would. And so it's important to give the opportunity to share those so others can say, oh, I can do that because I could see somebody else doing it. And I think it clicks more for other people when that does happen. And so I'm, I'm thankful that you're both here to, to you know, share your perspectives. And I our industry has a lot of work to do in this realm, but I am encouraged by the conversations that we're having and they, they don't feel as, they felt performative at times in the past where we go, okay, yeah, it's, it's women in construction week and things like that are very important. We need to have those conversations and give a window to highlight that in a focused way. But the perspective should be, here is a person who's doing cool stuff, who happens to be a woman, not here is a woman because they're a woman doing a thing. And I think that's a framing that is so important for us to have as we talk about the industry and empower and encourage others to be in it. And if the framing isn't right, it doesn't feel good to put it lightly. So I thank you for mentioning that. There's, there's a lot to, uh, to consider in that realm. I think now we have more stories and more um, role models to, to highlight as well. So that really helps. We do. We, yeah, we're, we do. we're doing better. There's it, like I said, there's a ton of work to do. And, you know, women at, at large make a very small percentage of the construction industry across the board. And people of color and other backgrounds make a very small percentage of leadership roles in companies as well, yeah. which is a problem because we could say, OK, we have a diversity point as far as just broad percentages. But we have to make sure we're also cultivating the opportunities for people to advance in the industry from diverse backgrounds, because having somebody in a leadership role with a different background from the other people on the leadership team brings a lot to the table. And so it's 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 important to talk about and give a real shake to those conversations. Otherwise, Otherwise, nothing changes. So flipping the first, que the last question that I asked both of you, was there anything that they were students were generally unimpressed by that you were surprised by or expecting a very opposite reaction? Evan, I'll kick that one to you first. Yeah, maybe this is uh, informed by like a, a recent presentation I gave at, uh, at Virginia Tech, but I think in general, um, augmented virtual reality 3D printing, these are things I get really excited about showcasing to students, but um, maybe based on their reactions, um, I feel like they, a lot of students are already familiar with some of these technologies, um, whether yeah, they yeah, have- Big deal. Yeah, yeah well, I, I try very hard to, you know, to, 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 to impress them, but um, I think, you know, maybe that's because they already, you know, they already have some level of familiarity with the, the hardware. Maybe they have an Oculus um, or HoloLens on, on campus that they're using for a project, or you know maybe they have a makerspace on campus that they've already um, you you know utilized for you know a, a class project. Um, you know I've tried to show off examples of VR for design review or digital mockups or you know multiplayer kind of collaborative meetings, but it doesn't seem to uh, resonate as much as I, I thought it would. Um, you know, but that being said, I think. Uh, they're in at they're at an advantage, so they may already have that familiarity. They may be unimpressed, but you know maybe when they enter their workforce, they'll they'll be the ones to think of the more uh, creative use cases on their projects. Yeah, and, and you get to build on that too because now it's not I have to teach you how to use the thing. They they already have a sense for it, and now it's how do we go big? I still I still hear a lot of people, especially with AR and VR, they put on an Oculus six years ago. And it wasn't great then. And most of my experience when I was still working at contractors was we modeled part of the building really quickly before our presentations after submitting a proposal in response to an RFP. Everybody in the room puts the goggles on and says, ooh, this is what our building looks like. And then that goes back on the shelf and everybody goes out, goes out and builds. And the, the perspective on the technology capability is six years out of date. And so if you're out there listening and your, your take on AR and VR and the tech is a bit, you know, 
dated, I beg you, go to a conference and ask somebody to give you a headset and take a peek because it is it's very different and you can do some really cool stuff. So uh, how about you? Uh, has there been anything where students were just like, yeah, get that away from me. I'm not yeah, interested. Yeah, I've had a similar experience. The students will humble you. Like you would go out there very enthusiastic about technology and robots and they just unimpressed. Um, and I think from the experience I've had is people um, being unimpressed with some of these emerging technologies. Um, you always have that inevitable question or at the, what's the point? Are the robots gonna take our jobs? Um, why are we using them? So they just don't wanna touch some of those. And also on the flip side, I've had students who are very unimpressed with traditional um, construction methods. And they want to learn about, you know, the ARs and the VRs, especially like when I was teaching estimating, like you have to start off with doing the manual things before you get into um, takeoff or whatever you're using. And it's, you know, I try to come with a balance, try to make them understand, you know, you can be on both ends. It's really a balance between you know, using the traditional methods, but using technology to improve the processes or make things you know, better. So I try to come at it with both lens and, you know, because I've learned that some students just don't want to hear about the robots. They don't want to hear about the drones and the laser scanners. They're, they probably have like traditional backgrounds. Some of them have worked or they have, you know, family members that work in construction. So they're used to that side of things. Uh, so I think it's just important to get them to see that, you know, both work hand in hand and you, one doesn't replace the other, I think, is, is an important message. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're at any risk of the robots rolling in and taking yeah. jobs away, but especially with the shortage and, you know, just augmentation. That's, that's the, the talk track that I always lean back on is these are tools and they're tools and not replacements that allow people to do the things that people do well and allow technology to do things at scale that people simply can't or it's too dangerous. It's like, do you really want to go in a confined space or do you want to send Spot down to go do that laser scan? Like, I'm cool not being in that pipe. Thank you so much. Like, you know, so there's there's a lot of, uh, I think it's, it's an extra layer of education actually to ensure people don't feel threatened by the tool, but also to your point to go, what's, what is the point of this? Showing them that and you go, hey, this is why we're doing this. It's not just because it's neat. It is, but also there is a, a value and a betterment to the contractors and the people, but also to the owners because of the, the information, the rich uh, data that they're gathering from all the different tools that we're laying on in our projects today. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. And so I've got two more questions for both of you. Thank you again for joining me here. And this is a recurring one that I ask every guest. And it's one of my favorites because I'm always surprised by the answers, unless you say tape measure or phone. Mm -hmm. If you say those two, I will not be surprised, but I'll still be happy that you answered it. So what is one tool that you will always bring to every project that you work on? Fope, take it away. Okay. Um at the risk of sounding too academic, uh, I would say adaptability is a mindset I approach every project with. Um, and it's, you know, something I've kind of heard you say throughout our conversation today. It's you have to be open to new ideas. You have to be, you know, be willing to ask questions and tackle the norm and um, find out unique solutions to different problems. So um, it's a skill that has, you know, left me open to change. Yes you know, brought me throughout different career roles and opportunities. And it consistently just allows me to enhance the quality of my projects, I would say. I love that. And both of you can speak to this very directly. Like it's very uncommon for a construction, if, if you're out on site every day, for every day to be exactly the same. And if you're not adaptable to some degree, you're going to struggle to be excited about your work because you know surprises come and so being able to pivot in the moment and think about new perspectives i think it's it's incredibly important so i love that answer that's great evan how about you what uh, what's one tool you'll bring to every project no matter what you're working on yeah i think i went in maybe a slightly different direction but i think um a sense of humor is really uh -huh. important that's good. um <laughs> i think you know ultimately we work in construction and in a people business uh you know, developing trust and a rapport with people is, is really important. Um, we also work in a very tense industry where a lot of, um, you know, heated arguments and um, tense negotiations and adversarial relationships. And I think, you know, um, sometimes it can be really helpful to break the ice, um, you know, 
you know, humor can go really a long way in, in, in making a connection with someone in the field, um, you know, developing that relationship. I've observed a lot of uh, positive relationships between people on the field. And I feel like, um, yeah, a sense of humor is um, maybe under, under, underappreciated. You're speaking to my heart right now because I'm rarely serious. Like you probably picked up on this a little bit as we're getting into our conversation today. And it might not be present in our serious tone of our conversation here, but it's it's such a rewarding when it's so rewarding when you have a work environment where you can still playfully have a bit of fun too. And and we're still obviously all here to do work and there's business things and such. But like you said, the the depth of the relationship that you get to have when you can use some humor in you know, very difficult situations goes a long way. I mean, I, I'm thinking back to the, the bid reviews that I've seen where people are very tense and you know, millions of dollars are on st at stake or there's a schedule slippage and everybody's losing their mind and liquidated damages or you know, a month away or something. And it, when you can diffuse some of those tense situations with humor, I think it kind of, people settle. And then you get to get back to the problem and you start working it out instead of just, you know, serious business all day long. I mean, being serious has its place, but I, uh, I try to keep that place as compartmentalized as possible. <laughs> well, I, I love both of those answers and they are both brand new ones for the show. So um, 10 points for that. And uh, last question for both of you, if our listeners want to get a hold of you or reach out or if there's anything you'd like to tell them about today, what's the best way to do that? Fope? Uh, LinkedIn. Sure. Great. And the details on spelling and show names are always in the show notes and such. And I think we'll include links to those as well. Evan, how about you? How do people reach out to you? Yeah, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, Evan Riley. Um, you know, if you're a student interested in career advice or, you know, a startup looking for feedback on a, on a product, happy to, happy to talk. I love that. And the feedback loop is so important, too, because if we're building all these tools in a silo, We've got a disconnect that ends up being problematic, especially on the field. So thank you both for joining me. And of course, I am your host, Eric Thomas. If you're listening on the audio version of this, I'm going to plead and beg with you to pop over to YouTube. The link is in the channel in the show notes, so you can check that out. We are in the Autodesk Technology Center. And like, who wouldn't want to take a look at all these robots? I mean, this is just really cool space. And if you want to reach out to me, of course, you can find me on LinkedIn as well or on Twitter at builder underscore digital. And then finally, I would be the worst and most bland pod podcast host ever. Or maybe this makes me boring. I don't know. To ask you politely to go out and review our show. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, go you know bump the five star button, write a couple words about how you're feeling. And uh, you can find us on YouTube if you look for the Autodesk Construction Cloud channel. So on that final note, goodbye. <laughs>